Hi, my name is Steven and I make fonts as Aerotype. Thanks for joining us today. I am working on Lang Gothic right now, which is a sans serif version of my family Lang. And I, I'm pretty early on in the process still, uh, though I've been sitting on this family also for quite a while. So right, if you've watched any of my videos, uh, I've been working on Lang a lot in the past a uh, couple of weeks. That was in preparation for an update, which I just released uh, yesterday at this point. And I'm working to try to bring Lang Gothic up to speed with it. Um, of course, up to speed is relative. Um, I don't really intend to give this all of the same features as Lang will get. That one is a little more of a decorative display family, though. I think it can work pretty nicely in text as well. This one is more of a simple family in a few respects. I've kind of limited the weight range just slightly. I've obviously simplified the letter designs and I'm not doing things like italic swashes in this family. One thing which I've been really wrestling with and trying to figure out today, and I think I'm kind of coming towards a conclusion is, uh, how much flair, if any, sort of, to give to the family. So by flair, I mean a couple of things. Uh, here are the characters that I'm really kind of playing with right now and, and trying to determine which way to push. Um, so there's the flat characters, like all of these E and F, you can see here, they've got a little bit of uh, chiseling or flaring um, from the inside to the outsides of these horizontals. Um, somebody just told me a great word for this and I, like a couple weeks ago, and I already am blanking on what that word is. Uh, if it comes to me, I'll say it. If you are thinking it right now, put in a comment. Um, I'm sure people will be interested. But yeah, there's this kind of like chisely look going on to it, um, slightly calligraphic maybe. And I introduced those kind of late in the process of working on Lang Gothic before it's 0.1 release because I have quite a bit of flaring going on in the round characters of this, um, or maybe the complex characters, uh, not only round. So you know, at the end of the terminals of the C, G, S, J, A, E. Uh, yeah, you can see that there's quite a bit of kind of a flaring here. I should actually show um, Lang itself so you can kind of see what I'm working off of essentially. So yeah, here's Lang and um, uh, we'll do the classic word there. And we'll pop this one next to it for a second. And gloves. Right, so you can kind of see perhaps why I made the decision to flare the serifs, not the serifs, the terminals. Um, this has ball terminals and serifs. And when you just chop those things off, if you only chop them off, well, you can't only chop them off because you know you'd be chopping way too early. But if you try to just chop them off, like what do you do? Uh, some families would do horizontals. I did try that, but it felt a little stiff to me. Uh, the thing I really am trying to capture with Lang, and let me turn off stylistic set three, is just this like total. Actually, I believe when you actually um, type out a word like this, it goes to this alternate G. What I was trying to capture in the original inspiration here was kind of like a, a cuteness for lack of a better word, just like this liveliness and excitement that Lang has or its uh, origins had. Um, yeah, and also kind of like an 1800s sort of feel. Um, so it felt like if I just went totally flat on the terminals, it was a bit too elegant maybe. Um, 
and not quite lively enough. So I'm not really basing that on specific historical examples. This is, I'm not even basing it really on uh, specific like gravestones as the top one is here. Um, I'm really just trying to say like, okay, if we take Lang as a design, what would it be um, ideally as like, what would a companion for this be? Companion fonts and choosing fonts to pair is like a big subject and hard to really cover in any sort of appropriate way. The short version of it is that it's like pairing an outfit. So it's like choosing shoes, pants, shirt, and a hat, maybe. You want to match something, right? So maybe it's like matching the color of your shoes and your belt is kind of a classic idea. Or maybe it's like your pants are dark green, so your hat is dark green. I don't know. I'm not really well-versed in fashion at all, as I'm sure you can tell. But um, font pairing is a bit of the same thing. So you kind of want to hopefully have some sort of similarities there. So as a graphic designer, if you're looking for a pair of fonts, um, well, as a type designer, my first thought has always been, why don't the type boundaries serve that um, desire? And a lot of them try to. Something I've been very conscious of as I've started developing my type library is trying to match the metrics of fonts as pretty much closely as I can while still allowing them to have you know, their own voice. Uh, but for instance, Lang's like X height, cap height, uh, ascender height, all matches that of name sans display, kind of the top optical size there. And then now Lang Gothic matches the metrics of Lang Right, but like what else besides just raw font size should you match? Um, kind of like a historical period is great to match, or sometimes it can be nice if there's some sort of echoes between the physical forms. So, you know, in this case, like the this is kind of what I see as like the simplified sans version of this. Um, and you know, more recently I gave Lang a slightly more boring, more normal G. So maybe it's closer to the simplified version of this. Um, and yeah, so that's all a long way of saying that's what I'm trying to do here. So because I was, I'll kind of go back to this one now. Because I am trying, where'd it go? I had it all pulled up, didn't I? Yes, here. Um, because I've got these flares going on to try to match those ball terminals of the originator Lang, I felt like these couldn't just be totally flat. It felt a little off to me somehow. So I added a little bit of uh, slope to these arms. And that kind of gives it maybe a bit of a chiseled into stone feel or, or something of the sort. Um, but I got a comment that maybe that wasn't the right approach. And so, I mean, not only am I responding to the comments, I was already kind of feeling like, is this right? It looks good to me, but like, uh, and by the way, I'm not only looking at it as these isolated letters. This is just an easy way for me to show uh, the specific letters that I'm thinking of for these changes. So long story short, today, especially I've been making some stylistic sets and just exploring, like if, so here's stylistic set 05. If I do go back to totally straightened arms, how will that look? Um, and then if that means that there's suddenly a mismatch between this, the flares of the round letters and the flat letters, and I'm not totally sure if that's the case. So I made a separate stylistic set to kind of poke at that idea and test it out. So stylistic set seven tries to say like, okay, if these should not have flair, maybe these should not have as much flair either. And this starts to get into territory that's um, a bit like a high contrast sans, not just, um, not just like a typical Gothic or grotesque. Um, the flaring is more of like a grotesque kind of move. Um, yeah, so 
I don't know. I'm I'm trying to like balance a bit of like historical, you know, uh, awareness. I guess is what I don't know. I'm not like the world's greatest type historian, um, but you know, trying to be aware of and I guess acknowledge all of the influences I have um, with like a bit of first principles thinking maybe like if we don't try to just match something that already exists and we're trying to build something that is new and interesting and kind of its own thing, what sort of a relationship makes sense? So that's kind of where I'm at. One thing I was doing to explore this beyond just, you know, word of mat So maybe I've got, um, no, um, I had some word of mat tabs pulled up. Um, but one thing I was doing was generating some very simple proofs where one page has kind of the existing defaults. And then this page has the stylistic sets applied. So I, made this with font proofer, which I've kind of mentioned in a previous video, this was a pretty good use case for it. Um, I mean, there's lots of good use cases for it, but this, this was a nice way. I haven't as much used it directly from like a glyphs app thing. So I haven't tested that connection as much. Um, basically you can open a font directly from glyphs. And then as long as the open type features are working, you can kind of generate fonts straight from it and put them in proofs, which is really cool and pretty handy. So yeah, this is kind of what I was doing today. Um, like here I'm tabbing between them and one tip I learned um, from the creator font proofer is that if you're viewing a file in preview, that's, that's ideal because when you generate a new proof, it will update. So let's just demonstrate that actually. Uh, I don't know, we'll just do some sort of very simple change here and just add um, some punctuation. And then if we save that change, and if I export a PDF, let's see, this should, I think automatically, because I'm saving it to the same name, nice. Yep, it adds the exclamation point. And there's kind of two ways you can view a proof in preview. One is, let me see if I'm remembering this correctly. Yeah, so this is kind of the default view. It just pulls it up um, matching the width and you can get there with command one. Um, but if you do command two, it fits the entire page in your viewport. So both of those can be useful, but this is a good general one. Oh, it looks like I messed up compatibility there. Um, so let me, fix that real fast because otherwise this will be totally confusing. Let's see, what did I do? Um, oops, we want G SS07. Oh, I see. I was just adding a bit of a compensation here, testing that out. And I didn't do it in my intermediate layer yet. So I need to add a point there. And then I had also added, I think, like a kind of ink trap thing. There we go. Cool. So now that is interpolating. And now this is actually a pretty good demo. Um, let's go to our page with the missing G. Let's export the PDF again. And here we are. And yeah, boom, RG is back. So that's really nice. Um, yeah, so then basically I was just kind of flipping back and forth between these. And I actually found it useful to be in the command one mode so I could have a little bit more detail. I don't know, obviously this would vary. Um, you can see that some of our things aren't really kerned yet, so that I guess I could turn off the kerning. Let me do that. That is something I should do. I think if I disable default features, it might 
um, turn off the kerning. Let's see, because kerning is an open type feature. It looks like something happened because suddenly it's overflowing a bit. Um, yeah, it looks like like furlong is no longer current. So there's this big gap in the FU uh, and like CA is not current as I'd expect. So that's good. Um, and yeah, basically I've just spent like quite a bit of time flipping between these today and thinking like, um, I, I actually added back in a little bit of flare just to kind of like, if you remove all flare, it looks a bit wrong to me. Um, and it looks too much like a low contrast sans, um, which is not quite what I want. Uh, yeah, so this is actually with sl a slight bit of uh, flare added back in, but not so much that the horizontals look out of place to me anymore. Like it looks kind of balanced and I will probably continue to mess with that a little further but I, I'm fairly happy looking at this. Like, I feel like I'm getting close to what I want. So in this video, I'm going to do that to the italics, or at least I'm going to record some of the process of bringing those into the italics. And as I do that, I'll kind of show the process of setting up stylistic sets and being able to do that in a way in glyphs. Um, the one other thing I should say, I think is I wasn't only, you know, basing that decision off of simply looking at it in glyphs and font proofer, like one little document. I was also kind of going to the future font slides that I've made for um, Lang Gothic and kind of looking at it in there. Um, so there's also this specimen. And so this is really a more instructive place to look at it, I would say. Um, oh yeah, here's the other thing I've been trying. Like, uh, do I really need the spur on the G? Um, this is a form I love because it's really frequent in actual gravestones. Um, and so I might go for that, but probably I'll reserve it for a stylistic set. Um, because it's a little hard to read at first glance, I would say. But yeah, the um, italic right now actually really shows just how much difference there is. Um, so like, let's look at this for a second. Um, if you look at this S in Jessup versus the S in Douglas, you see uh, after these tweaks, this looks like that, and this almost looks like bell bottoms or something at this point. Uh, so I, yeah, and I'm not sure. This this might even be one step. Like this in the A might be one step too unflared. But after thinking about this more, I think this is two steps too flared in the italic. So I'm going to yeah experiment with adjusting that and see where it takes me. Um, one other thing I'll try to get to, I'll probably do an a, abbreviated version of this in the italics, maybe just run through the S. Um, I will show how I like to substitute fonts in InDesign in a way that I think is much more uh, efficient than you know, trying to click through every page or even trying to use like paragraph styles and stuff uh, for everything. Okay, uh, be, the, I love paragraph styles, by the way, but in the context of like a type specimen or a bunch of slides of typography, they're not always the most helpful. It varies. Maybe I'm just not using it as well as I could. That's probably, you know, definitely part of it. But yeah, it, it's hard to set up those styles before you've nailed down what something should be. So if you're using lots of styles of type and trying to play with design a lot, then yeah, it doesn't always 
lend itself to being as formulaic as paragraph styles and character styles may want you to be. All right, um, Lang Gothic Italic. Here I was uh, adjusting some of the uh, accent marks. Okay, so let's go back here actually if I can. This will be slightly different, I'd say, for the italic. Maybe I'll actually just filter to Latin basic and pick them from here, the ones that I am pretty sure need to change. And then I'll have to do another pass to see if I've missed anything. Of course, I could just pull these up as the alphabet as well, but. OK. Oh, and then we've got our numerals. I have too many tabs open. Let's close a bunch and just kind of start a little bit fresh. OK, so let's copy that. All right, um, well, first thing, to set up a stylistic set as I was to kind of test this sort of thing, um, go to your letter, and you can just be in front of it in text mode, T, and then hit Command D, and that creates an alternate. And this is, by the way, a pretty nice way to experiment in a not very formal way, like not even using stylistic sets necessarily, but just you know, having backups as you go and iterate. But, but let's try to kind of make this a stylistic set. So, okay, first thing I'm gonna say stylistic set 05, because that's what I was doing in the last one. And while we're here, let's knock this Oganek into the right spot. Okay. And uh, that's just three. And I'm seeing that's also just three. And I did make these slightly thicker as well because they felt a little bit on the thin side maybe. So let's kind of uh, knock it just slightly thicker. All right, so you can see maybe the difference there. Let's do that in our uh, boulder weight as well. Glyphs kind of helps you to align points. It like kind of is slightly magnetic when you're dragging things around, so that's pretty nice. 158, 164, okay. So let's start making this feature. Oh, I'm glad I had a, well, I guess there's a reason I had set it for SSO5. Okay, so this is automatic, which is pretty cool. Um, we'll also do, say, let's change the S. Um, I'm gonna knock this into the, I mean, oh. I chose a really tricky one, actually of course, but oh well, it's also very visible. So it won't look as beautiful as it will in the end in this initial demo. It usually takes me kind of a bit of fussing. In fact, let's um, put this to one side and this to the other side, just to see if this might work. That is just to have like a reference point for how much we want to flare this or not. Um, and I'm using this control option editing, so it kind of like 
moves these points around a little bit. That just helps keep it a little more controlled and fast. That is when I change this point, this off curve also changes a bit, which is pretty nice. Okay, let's copy that one into the background as well. Command B to get back there. Sometimes I'm moving while well, holding Option, so I'm just moving the point and not the off curve point. And I'm trying to sort of change the angle here so that it's, that's why I'm doing it like that. All right, uh, I'm not following this super closely or well necessarily, but that's a start. Okay, so that is most of the flaring removed, but maybe not all of it. There's like a little bit there still. And let me set up that as a stylistic set seven. Oh no, all right, I did the video mistake. That's okay. I did the video mistake where I was editing this without making the duplicate first. But this is good in a way because I can show you what I do when that happens. So one solution would be to duplicate it now and then just do Command Z a bunch in the first clip. I think that should work. Let's give that a try just to see. Okay, I know I want that to be SSO7, and that does it for both layers, which is nice. So. Yeah, it's pretty subtle, but you see us command Zing out our mistakes. But the other thing I'll mention is that I'm using Glyph's package format. So the really nice thing about this is that I've got my project open in, it's a Git project, and I've got it open with VS Codes, Git View. So what I can do is a Glyph's package saves everything as individual Glyph files, which like files for each Glyph which is super nice. So I know that I don't want my default S to be updated. I only want the change in all the other things, um, such as the SS07. So what I can do is, uh, and I don't even remember necessarily the exact syntax for this, it's get reset something, but it's really nice here. I can just click this discard changes arrow and it's saying, are you really sure you want to? And yes, I do. And boom. So let's see how that plays with glyphs. It may or may not update in the background, actually. It doesn't as well as I would like. So I'm going to close out of this document. Robofont is slightly better at that, actually. Uh, it picks up on changes and alerts you about them. All right, so here we are back to our original bell bottom S but we also have this alternate here, which is just kind of like a bit of Git magic. And that's one reason I use Git. Uh, it's like a good checkpoint that you're always kind of saving. And you don't always know that you need it until after, well, you seldom need the seatbelt or the helmet uh, or checkpoint when you think you do. But yes, sometimes when you do, it's nice to have. Okay. so. Yeah, these still have a little or a lot too much flaring. That is the SSO7. I'm just going to make this Well, I shouldn't be getting super hung up on I'm not sure hard thing about type design is that it's hard to know when you've spent too much time or not enough time on something. Okay. Well, I believe I've spent enough time on it for the next step of this demo. Um, so let me make a commit, by the way, starting to move low flare, uh, 
experiment into italic source. Okay, and that commit kind of covers that bit. And then I'm going to make clean and make, and this is running parts of my build. And the build here is pretty quick, so I might cut this anyway. All right, so that's still running a little bit, but um, font goggles has popped up. Meaning that, uh, meaning that I didn't yet um, set up the, <laughs> I did set up the E, but I don't think I set up the, uh, this part. Yeah, stylistic set seven. When I'm not narrating, I swear I'm like at least 5% smarter. Okay. All right, so let's do this again. Um, make clean and make. Okay, so now actually we see font goggles and it's already updated, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, to, sh to prove that better there, you can really see the difference. Let's make it an actual word. Well, ease might be an actual word, but here. Um, yeah, so before those changes, things look like this. And then after, things look like that. So definitely a bit of adjustment. And let me just finish this off by showing you how I would update this then in InDesign because that's a nice step to take as well. And then I'll have I'll look at the time and decide whether to film any more of this like italic adjustment. It'd be nice, um, but I'll have to think. Okay, uh, let's go to the font and let's show it. Oops, I actually want the full version, please. I'm going to toss it in my fonts folder and say, yes, replace that one, please. I'm going to then make sure the InDesign documents are saved, and then I'm going to quit out of it, command Q, and then open InDesign again. And I have to quit it and reopen it to make sure it actually gets the font updates. Thank goodness font updates are basically working that painlessly nowadays. Um, on the previous version of Mac OS, like I literally, I don't know if it was Mac OS or my computer or some mix of the two, but I literally had to restart my computer or like do some pretty intense cache busting stuff every time I updated a font installation. It was very annoying. Glad it's a little less painful than that. Uh, by the way, you can see that the G updated now. I added that spur back on. Um, I wonder, oh yeah. Interesting uh, that that looks like an option, but it's not. It's early uh, open type feature stuff. Let's open the specimen because the example was better shown, shown showed there. Um, shown, I think. I don't know. Uh, siblings should show it. I really liked this. Um, which it was in here somewhere. Well, I mean, um, Rutgers will definitely show it. 
and I'm curious. It might already be applied, actually. Let's find out. Um, character, open type. It is. Okay, well, that's nice. <laughs> um, just to compare and contrast, let's see it without Stylistic 7. Okay, yeah, so you can really see the difference there. It's hard. I don't know. I, I'm i really still sh recording this, certainly, maybe sharing it before I've come to a firm conclusion on this. Um, so I don't know. That's part of design, I, I feel like, is like actually thinking hard about what you want to put into the world and like what the best possible option is. Um. Yeah, I think I think it's useful to test things and go back and forth. Sometimes doubt yourself. Uh, I, at least for me, I think that's a good like thing worthy of. Uh, I don't know. Pray. I don't know. I. <laughs> if you have watched any of my videos, you know that I spend a good time, uh, chunk of time doubting myself. I think. Um, I'm really just trying to dig deep and like actually come to a conclusion of what I think and try to find a conclusion that maybe I would still agree with in a couple of years. Like that's the ultimate goal maybe. Um, and also a conclusion that isn't just winging it, um, but maybe has some logic behind it. <laughs> and either way I go, I want to, execute it in such a way that people will enjoy it and it would be a useful typeface. So I'm just talking too much though. Okay, IAT Lang Gothic. If I want to change an entire typeface, this is how I like to do it. So I go into Command F for find change, I believe. Um, that shortcut could be wrong, but I don't think it is. And then I go to this T magnifying glass and say font family. And I put the font family here that I want to find so I can swap it out. And then I usually, if I want to change all the styles, which is important sometimes because I've got a lot of styles in many of my font families, I specifically delete whatever's in font file and then tab out. And yeah, I, I pretty much try to just set the font family and then keep everything else blank. So you can see that the find format is that. Now to set, for instance, um, well, all right, a better example, just um, to make it super clear. Um, let's swap this for Lang. OTF, I would prefer, um, and delete that as well. All right, so we have a find format and a change format. I'm going to change all. Ah, okay, it's only replacing one thing because it was searching the story, but if I search document, 93 replacements made. So it changes the entire document, which is really cool and really handy if you're trying to like Say you've changed the font name for something. Sometimes this is the fastest way to update your document again. Uh, it doesn't change stuff in the paragraph styles and character styles, which is deeply frustrating, but it's a start. Um, if you're really clever about your paragraph styles, you could probably like make the first one cascade and then change it just there. I don't know. Um, so let's kind of reverse this a little bit and say we want to change Wait, we want to find AT Lang and we want to change it to um, AT Lang Gothic. No wait here either. And I want to add open type features. Ooh, simplified cap arms, that's stylistic set five, and low flare, that's stylistic set seven. I'm going to click OK. And now, change all, 91 replacements made. Cool. So, yeah. 
I should probably put that in like <laughs> the context of a YouTube short at some point maybe, but that's a helpful tip I found um, for kind of relatively quickly updating a big type specimen document. And if you've ever made one of these, you know it can be a huge challenge to wrangle a bunch of styles of font, uh, of type. Um, yeah. So I think I am going to pause this and just kind of put my nose to the grindstone and make these italic updates and not talk <laughs> while I do it. Uh, and then I can better decide what to end up with. Um, and this font update will be coming out really soon. So if you keep an eye on my Instagram and uh, future fonts, you'll probably see uh, which way I decide for now to take it. Um, it's still only the 0.2 version of the family. So I do reserve the right to flip flop um, as many times as I feel is necessary <laughs> uh, to come to a conclusion that I am really proud of and excited to call a version one. Um, yeah, but for now, I think this is headed in a direction I like, and I wanted to share a little bit of that process of how I'm exploring the options. Um, yeah, if you're designing type, I hope that's helpful. If you're working on anything creative or analytical or whatever, I hope it's going great. Thanks for spending time with me. Please leave a comment if uh, you found anything here interesting. And yeah, thanks so much for watching.